Thanks for uh, braving the weather. And uh, I think the starting joke is the sound of fear is snow. Um, and that, that should make uh, more sense later. So I study marmots, and um, marmots are groundhogs and their relatives. Um, there are 14 or 15 species of them. They live around the northern hemisphere. Um, we have a holiday. I've studied eight of the 14 species. There's a holiday named after them, um, which is involved with weather, by the way. Um, uh, it's, it's, a big, it's a big event at the Blumstein Lab in, in uh, UCLA. We have an annual party. Um, but if you think about it, it's the only holiday named after an animal. It's the only holiday um, that is about <coughs> animal behavior because it's tied in with hibernation. And really, it's a human midwinter festival that used to be a, 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 a pagan holiday. And then uh, the Catholics picked it up as Candle Mass Day. And it's about weather. And it's about, it's about uh, males coming up and looking around um, for females, basically, and, and maybe predicting whether the winter, weather's going to go on. So we have movies about this, which uh, are kind of fun. Um, but generally, we make, funny, we make fun of uh, Groundhog Day in the US. Um, whereas in Europe, these groundhogs have a uh, northern hemisphere circumpolar distribution, people admire marmots in Europe. There are statues to marmots. You know, This is a, a major statue in Switzerland. Um, there's a museum of marmots. You should go there. You can, you can listen to all the marmots in the world, but you'll hear all the marmots today. Um, some of the species are endangered. The Vancouver Island marmot was down to about 30 in the wild. Um, when I was studying them, I didn't need inferential statistics. I, I used them anyway, but I didn't need them because I pretty much was studying all of them. Um, successful captive breeding and reintroduction program is recovering those guys. Today, however, I want to talk uh, about where marmots have taken me. And I want to think about alarm calls and take a Tinbergian view of alarm calls where we talk about the evolution a bit, function a bit, causation and meaning. And then ask a couple questions, do marmots cry wolf, and talk about individuality and the importance of reliability assessment. And then I want to um, tell you a story that started when I was holding a baby marmot and it screamed in my hands and I almost dropped it. And um, how that led to a whole research program that has taken me to Hollywood and now I scare people as well. So. Um, that's, that's the outline, and let, let's just get into it. So marmots have alarm calls. Um, their alarm calls are distinct. And for people that study birds, you often hear convergence in avian alarm calls. And there are good reasons to expect convergence in calls. But um, these are only emitted in alarming situations, very, very, very rarely social situations. And the social situations are emitted under are when an animal is getting beaten up by another, um, which is an alarming situation. Um, they're not used as territorial calls, et cetera. So let's listen to these, and I want you to appreciate the uh, diversity in them, roughly from the top to the bottom. Himalayana. Siberica. Kamchatka. Papacina. Bobak. Caudata. Mensbury. Brower eye. Marmota, normal, and then start high. Monax. That's the woodchuck. Probably has a whistle too, but. Olympus, an ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Caligata. An ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Vancouverensis. Ascending, descending, flat, kiaw, trill. Flavaventris. A whistle and then a trill. dog breathing. Um, so there, there, there's, there's a lot of diversity in these. And I've spent a chunk of time trying to understand that diversity and try to explain that diversity. Phylogenetically, we can see, this is sort of an old phylogeny, that large repertoires evolved once and that close relatives resemble themselves each other more than more distant relatives. Um, but there's a lot of um, evolutionary flexibility in, in call structure. You also see in this that repertoire size differs um, quite a bit. Um, and uh, previous studies have demonstrated that repertoire size evolves, bigger repertoires evolve, uh, 
repertoire size is correlated with an increase in social complexity. More socially complex species, and this is a, using a metric of social complexity that involved using information theory, um, that seems to be associated with the evolution of call repertoire size. Structure, a lot of studies have looked at structure, I've done, and, and the acoustic environment doesn't explain it. Other things don't explain it. They all have the same predator or mix of types of predators. Um, it, it, there seems to be drift processes um, explaining some of these differences in the actual call structure. Now, calls could be um, directed to predators to signal pursuit or detection and therefore to discourage pursuit. Um, or calls could be directed to conspecifics, maybe to warn kin. Everyone thinks about kin selection being an important thing. Or maybe to create pandemonium through which you can escape. Um, and uh, 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 in rodents, and, and, and this is sort of a question I, I worked with for years, because these are not mutually exclusive hypotheses. Both could be occurring. And I haven't figured out how to tease apart the intra versus interspecific communication function of alarm calls in any single species. But if you look at rodents in general, and you look at 266 species of rodents, and make a couple assumptions, it seems the initial function of calling was directed to predators. The initial audience was predators. And that conspecific warning, which many people study now, is really an exaptation. So um, calling, alarm calling, produ production of alarm calls did not evolve with um, sociality. Um, and nocturnal species, where you can't really detect what's going on around you um, and don't really know what the true threat is, um, species typically don't give alarm signals in rodents. So, Calling was associated with diurnality, and then making a couple assumptions, you can sort of say the initial function probably was to tell the predator um, it's been detected, possibly to discourage pursuit. So I've spent a lot of time these days studying um, the marmots in the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, um, located outside Crested Butte, Colorado. Um, Ken Armitage started the study of marmots there in 1962. Um, I worked with Ken as a postdoc. Taught me how to marmot here before graduate school. I worked with him as a postdoc, and then I've been running the project since 2001. And it's one of these priceless demographic records where um, we really can and are um, using this sort of thing to understand evolutionary dynamics of a whole bunch of traits, um, selection on traits, um, population biology, and uh, uh, there's a broad collaboration network asking lots of, of, of questions with these marmots. It's a nice place to work. Um, so in a very proximate sense, you can ask the question, you know, we know something about the evolution of calling and why, you know, maybe who, who the audience is and why animals may call, but what makes animals call? So in a very proximate sense, um, are stress hormones, glucocorticoids, associated with calling? So yellow-bellied marmots are quite convenient in some respects. They sometimes call when they're in the live trap. So we live trap them pretty regularly, and sometimes they call. And sometimes they poop in the live trap. And uh, the, the set of those two things provides a data point. You can collect the poop, you have a call, and then you can look for relationships between what that animal's physiological condition or state is and what it produced. It turns out that if they're likely to call in a trap, they're also likely to call it when we walk towards them. And they're also likely to call um, when a predator comes through. So unlike some colonial ground squirrels or prairie dogs. There doesn't seem to be contagious calling where everyone starts calling. Some certain individuals call, and there's a variation in who calls in a given situation. So we took these feces and we extracted um, glucocorticoid metabolites, digested um, stress hormones, and looked for a relationship between these two things: probability of calling, or the court level on, a, on a, an occasion when an animal called and didn't. And what we found was that when an individual called. She had systematically higher glucocorticoid metabolite levels than on an occasion when she didn't call. So hold this thought. Individuality is something that we see in you know, most animals. And um, I'm later, I'm later going to be talking about nervous Nellies and cool hand Lucies. And if some individuals are more likely to call, maybe that's because their court, a mechanism of this could be systematic differences in, in, in court. So what do calls mean? Um, in a lot of animal communication studies, people don't necessarily think about meaning. But meaning is one of those dimensions of, of communication that one can ask as well. So calls, because these are alarm calls, they're elicited in a certain situation when there's a predator around. So you can begin to ask, um, what do they mean? Are they communicating the degree of risk? If they're communicating the degree of risk, they could be communicating response urgency or how far um, an individual is to a predator. But in this sort of case, you might have the same predator creating two different risk scenarios. Or um, 
that then you wouldn't have a, a predator-specific alarm call. Alternatively, um, individuals could have predator-specific alarm calls. And for years, people were excited about this because human language has lots of attributes. One of those is the ability to label external objects or events. And many people thought that human language was all about emotional communication. And here's an example, if this is occurring, where um, animals are labeling things, giving nouns to things. And in that case, you would you need, in order to demonstrate reference or functional reference, you need to um, find a high degree of production specificity. A fox always elicits a fox-type alarm call. An eagle always elicits an eagle-type alarm call. Eagles never elicit fox alarm calls, and foxes never elicit eagle alarm calls. And some species have things like that. And then you've got species like meerkats that do a bit of both. We do a bit of both. We can label things, and we can say, you know, very risky, or this is a very close um, eagle. So can meerkats. So, you know, you go out, and I don't hear a lot of alarm calls in the field, so we sit there and we record calls, and we, um, and, and we apply our armamentaria of fear, which include things like Robo Badger and Eagle Knievel. Um, Eagle Knievel was named because you fly a glider, big glider, over, um, you know, marmots and, and alpine meadows, alpine meadows, rocky alpine meadows. You've got to land that thing somehow. You can't land it. It breaks in pieces. You glue it back together. It gets heavier, flies faster, crashes more. And, you know, if you remember who Evil Knievel was, same sort of thing. Um, so looking at a whole bunch of species. Oh, and by the way, so the lesson to students on this one is don't believe anything you ever read. So I chose marmots specifically to look at this question broadly and comparatively because some species were reported to have functionally referential calls while others weren't. Um, and I got, I somehow convinced the NIH to give me money to do this because for that week they were interested in understanding the biological basis of things they're interested in, like language. So I figure, you know, let's strike while the striking's hot. And, uh, you know, marched around the northern hemisphere scaring marmots. And what I found was that no species really has highly functionally referential abilities. So you sort of force yourself into a human language paradigm and you ask silly questions. But look at all this mechanistic diversity. And as a biologist, I'm, you know, quite excited by diversity, either number of alarm calls or, you know, mechanisms of communication. So all these guys communicate risk, but some of them package their alarm calls. So they might have a, a five-note alarm call when the predator's far away and a two-note alarm call when the predator's close. And the number of calls may track distance to the predator. Um, and some package them the other way. They have a five-note alarm call when the predator is close and a two-note alarm call when the predator is far away. Others vary the rate of calling or the number of calls. And Vancouver Island marmots, the ones that are about to go extinct that have five different call types, um, have some form of syntax. If you manipulate the order of callings and playback experiments, you get different sorts of responses. All sorts of mechanistic diversity. Evolutionary ecological question left standing is why? Don't know. Um, but it's, it's interesting. But we made some traction looking at um, uh, repertoire size. Well, in addition to um, communicating risk, alarm calls contain a lot of other potential information. Alarm calls, yellow, and so I'm, I'm going to drill down and look at yellow-bellied marmots for the rest of my discussion about marmots. But yellow-bellied marmot alarm calls contain information about age. Um, the frequencies of pups is a little higher than um, older animals. Sex and identity. And interestingly, um, you can ask questions about, well, why identity? What's going on with identity? Individually distinctive vocalizations are, are found and easily understood in things like group or territorial calls, contact calls, keeping track of other individuals, Sam, Mary, Fred, Sam, Mary, Fred. Everyone's keeping track of everyone else, and if there's benefits to being in a group, you might get that. If they're group or territorial calls, you know, you're in the group, you're not in the group. Good reasons to expect selection, potentially on producers to make distinctive sounds and certainly receivers to hear it, to respond to them. Um, parent offspring recognition, if you're a seal or a penguin and leave your kid on some, you know, Arctic beach or Antarctic beach and go away to forage for a while and come back, you've got to find your kid again. Strong selection on junior to say junior and mom to say junior and then to find each other. You know, strong selection on the signaler and the receiver. But alarm calls are, I think, a little different. Um, you can always throw out kinship may be important, but they don't call every day. They, don't, they only call when they're scared. Um, and some of the better hypotheses about why one might produce um, individually distinctive alarm calls um, is about reliability. And it all goes back to the boy who cried wolf. 
So if there are nervous Nellies and there are cool hand Lucy's, if the individuals have different propensities to call, it probably behooves you to pay attention to who's calling. And if it's costly to respond to these vocalizations, um, respond appropriately, meaning maybe you'd want to discount calls from Nervous Nelly because Nervous Nelly's always calling, like the boy who cried wolf. So the boy who cried wolf hypothesis makes a lot of sense. I didn't like how people were studying it, and I didn't believe the evidence was that good. So I went in and said, I can do better. So I said, I first did a really nasty experiment. And I still feel guilty about this experiment. Um, we created a reliable um, marmot by pairing her calls um, with the presence of a badger. Marmots hate badgers. They don't, you know, they're scared of badgers. Badgers eat them. And what we did was we trained the marmots in, in, in basically 10 minutes um, by hosing the meadow, by, by putting out a badger and hosing the meadow with alarm calls from one individual for 10 minutes once. On another occasion, the meadow, everyone heard um, another animal calling repeatedly, um, but the badger was covered up and wasn't uncovered. So if any, there were any acoustic or uh, olfactory cues associated with the badger, they weren't there. So it was only the sight of a badger was paired with one individual's call, um, you know, uh, broadcast for 10 minutes. On another occasion, there was an unreliable individual. And we did pre-tests and post-tests. And um, if the boy who cried wolf hypothesis is correct, um, the unreliable individual would be discounted. So let me tell you how we actually study these guys. We put a pile of food out there, horse food. They love horse food. They come out. They start foraging. We broadcast um, an alarm call. And either we're looking at difference from baseline foraging rates after hearing an alarm call, or we're comparing different sorts of things. But the point is, foraging is a very sensitive assay. They're going to look up. We've optimized this so they don't immediately run into their burrow, because you can blow them out and they run into their burrow. But they're, they're going to look, and they're going to look for different amounts of time. And they're going to forage for different amounts of time. Now, if they're not foraging, they can be looking and running and walking and doing other things. So foraging, time allocated to foraging, mostly trades off with vigilance, but it's the sensitive assay for this perceptual experiment. So if the boy who cried wolf hypothesis is true, they should forage um, less while hearing the reliable caller, right? They should ignore the un reliable caller, they should pay attention to the reliable caller, and they should forage less. We found the exact opposite. So I don't believe any single experiment, including experiments I do. This, by definition, because it's a nasty experiment where we had to habituate animals or potentially habituate animals to alarm calls, and they re rely on this. It was a small sample size. We, by definition, we set it up with, a point, with an alpha of 0.1. Um, OK. When I first saw this, I thought we somehow transposed our data. We re-extracted everything, reanalyzed everything. It was the same result. That's kind of strange. So we did a bunch of other experiments and other observations that, that are actually pretty consistent with this idea that um, reliable individuals or situations um, uh, are, are not discounted in some sense. Um, so reliable or, or are discounted. Um, so the other is, so marmots forage more while hearing a caller artificially made reliable. Um, meaning they're paying, they're, they're, not, they're not discounting it. They're, they're, they're going on and foraging. Um, marmots forage more while hearing an undegraded and they're presumably higher risk calls. So if I'm really close to you and I'm calling um, because you're close to me, you're probably exposed to a very similar risk. If you're very far away from me um, and I'm calling, that risk could be near me or it could be near you, but you don't know. So there's more uncertainty. So most species are pretty good at ranging um, vocalizations. So we degraded vocalizations and we played them back at the same amplitude. So we, and, and what we found is that marmots forage more while hearing undegraded calls, something coming from closer than a degraded call. Okay? Marmots forage more after hearing calls from older animals as opposed to potentially unreliable pups. It's kind of interesting. Um, and this is the exact opposite of, of, of various findings from vervet monkeys, bonnet and rhesus macaques, steppe marmots, richards and ground squirrels, all that found the exact opposite. So why do marmots seemingly discount calls from reliable individuals? Well, thought about this a lot. Um, unreliable individuals or situations are unreliable specifically because it's difficult to assess the true risk of predation. They don't know. They look, but then they go back to foraging. So it's almost as though they're trusting that someone they trust or a situation they trust or a context they, they, they're in control of, they look around and they get back to what they're doing. 
um, unreliable calls and situations elicit independent um, investigation. Oops. So we should generally expect, I think, evolutionary flexibility and mechanisms of communication. And here we're seeing a different way that reliability assessment is important. And while I was somewhat skeptical going into this about the importance of reliability assessment, I'm absolutely convinced reliability assessment explains why there's individuality in alarm calls, but how it works in different systems seems to be the, the question of the day. It's not always the boy who cried wolf. Could be something else. So in Los Angeles, this is sort of, you know, what fear sounds like. And in Gothic, this is sort of what fear sounds like. So that's a baby marmot. And the first time I heard that, they, they do this about nine or 10 days of emerging from their natal burrow. They're kind of defenseless. They're sort of cute. Um, I'm holding it gently, and it does this thing, and I almost dropped it. And I'm like, that's interesting. I'm not usually emotionally aroused by the sounds I hear animals making. Why did I feel like almost dropping it? Well, it's a scream. And why do animals scream? So I started reading around. And, and Darwin, by the way, didn't know marmots. When you, when, as soon as the first digital Darwin came online, you know, I'm like Googling, you know, does, marmot, does Darwin, this is before Google, um, you know, does Darwin know marmots? No, Darwin doesn't know marmots. As soon as Darwin got back you know, to, to England, he never left home again. He never went to the Alps, so he never saw marmots. Um, and, uh, but he, he knew screams. And he said screams are calls for assistance um, emitted often by highly aroused animals, often as a way for young to solicit help from their parents. And, the first sort of naive question is, well, you know, are screams typical alarm calls? How are they different? How are they not? Um, so let's, let's look at this. They sound certainly very different. So that's a normal uh, alarm call, simple harmonic structure. And if you look at these two alarm calls, these are from two different individual adult females. And you can see that there's slight differences in the durations and the frequencies that these are given and sort of emphasis of, of various um, harmonics. And, and those are the sorts of things that are the individual differences. Well, interestingly, um, meerkat alarm calls become noisier, if you will, as urgency increases. So meerkats are a species that have different types of alarm calls for aerial and terrestrial predators. They also have recruitment calls that are kind of like normal alarm calls. But as that situation gets more urgent, um, predator gets closer, recruitment is happening under a more important urgent situation. Um, there's a lot of noise or deterministic chaos or something else that's coming into these, these calls. Um, and that's kind of interesting. And you can think about, well, what is this noise or what is this deterministic chaos? And you can think about um, vocal production systems where you have some oscillator um, oscillating um, that, that is produced by air being blown through uh, cross vocal cords or syrinx, and it vibrates, and then everything else after that you know, the, the structure of it's manipulated by the filter. You can convince yourself of that by, um, you know, going, oh, 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 you know, and change the shape of that filter, and it changes that sound. But one of the characteristics also is once it, if it's, if the air is going across this oscillator too fast, um, it can become, produce chaotic types of sounds. And it's kind of like overblowing a trumpet. Um, if I could blow a trumpet, you could blow it, blow it, blow it, blow it, blow it, and at some point it goes nonlinear, and what comes out is somewhat unpredictable. Same thing that happens when you turn up your stereo. It gets louder, louder, louder. That system is linear, and at some point it goes nonlinear. And nonlinear non systems can be described in their range of, I guess, the linear, the linear part of their range, but they can also become that some they can also become nonlinear abruptly. So in Bioacoustics, people talk about nonlinear acoustic phenomena, and they, they talk about things like subharmonics, which are um, bands of energy um, between harmonics, or deterministic chaos, which is broadband energy, um, which I would say, for all intents and purposes, sounds like noise. I, I need to play around with this more, but it's noise essentially, but formally it's deterministic chaos. Biphonations and side, uh, are, are, are sidebands adjacent to the harmonic. Um, warbles or abrupt frequency transitions um, also are characteristics of the or types of these nonlinear acoustic phenomena. So let's so so what if what if these screams and other nonlinear acoustic phenomena are produced when animals are under increased the urgency of a situation is 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 greater? Turns out the structurally 
the structure of these screams is acoustically convergent among lots of species, and it's likely to be ancestral. So if we listen to cottontail rabbits, or gray foxes, or white-tailed deer, um, or your baby, um, or a marmot, or a dog, you know, all of these things are, 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 are remarkably uh, acoustically similar. So yellow-bellied marmots, and you would call them a scream, you would classify them as a scream. Yellow-bellied marmot, adults and pups, communicate risk by varying the number and rate of their calls. Whistles are the most common call type. They're individually distinctive. So we looked at screams that were sometimes emitted by these pups about nine days of emergence from their natal burrow. And if we look at a pup alarm call, pu alarm, pups can alarm call starting on day one of emergence. Sounds something like that. And you heard the scream before. Very different. So when I first saw these, I was thinking, well, if you just look at you know, one of these calls, it goes up and down. This kind of goes up and down, but then it sort of changes a little. And back when I was in school, we had music classes. I don't think they have music classes anymore, or at least they don't in LA. Um, and the teacher would get you know, this, this, this chalk and put it on that thing and scrape it across the board. And that would be the, you know, the musical notes or whatever, and you write the notes on that. So I figured, well, maybe this, instead of going up and down, it's just sort of spread out. And it goes up, and then there's a little more opportunity for it to vary. So I, I, the initial thing I saw was you know, a duration difference in, in each of these elements, but then there's other stuff as well. OK, so we made a bunch of measurements on these things, and we noted there are also a bunch of these nonlinear acoustic phenomena, um, and um, that's kind of interesting. So you can make a whole bunch of, look at a bunch of these things, and you find that screams differ from calls in all uh, measured features. They're longer, and they're a lower frequency than calls, which is kind of interesting. So a pup screaming produces a lower frequency sound. A really vulnerable animal produces a really low frequency sound, lower frequency than it normally can produce, which is interesting because maybe they're bluffing their size. So animals are constrained in the lowest frequency they can produce based on their body size. Maybe there's some bluffing going on here. If we look at scream characteristics, they frequently had deterministic chaos or, or noise. Uh, most of them had subharmonics, some had biphonation, most had warbles. They're also highly individually, uh, individualistic. Statistically, you can discriminate individuals based on their screams. And in fact, while you know, if, if an animal was alarm calling, including a pup, um, the mother or other animals would never come towards us. Sometimes when we were holding pups and they were screaming, their mothers came out of their burrow and looked at us. Um, and that never happened. Um, so that was, that was interesting. Are they more evocative than alarm calls? So what we did here was we have a baseline period of the animals foraging on bait, and then we play back either an alarm call from an adult, an alarm call from a pup, or a scream. And in that first 15 seconds following that, regardless of what individuals heard, they suppressed their foraging behavior. And then they recovered to um, you know, a, a approximately baseline um, conditions. But they recovered much faster after hearing an alarm call from a pup or an adult than they did a scream. So both the main effect and the um, interaction is significant in this. So screams are more evocative than alarm calls. When I said that I thought that the thing that initially struck me was the duration of these were different, um, we synthesized an average scream. So this is an average scream. We made a bunch of measurements on a bunch of calls and then came up with, well, used some software to synthesize the average scream. We then could um, computationally make it two standard deviations shorter and two standard deviations longer and did a playback to ask what happened there. And we found that long screams suppressed foraging more than short screams or alarm calls. Um, so there's something with duration, scream duration, that is, is, is evocative as well. So you read around the literature and you try to you know, understand what's going on. And you find that these nonlinearities are common in highly aroused animals. Chimpanzee pant hoots, <laughs> overblowing their system, getting um, kind of noisy. Dog barks. Dogs do two different sorts of things, actually. I mean, you know when your dog's really upset. Um, when it's really upset, it might get a little whiny. But you know, raspy, noisy barks are different than happy play barks. And we hear that. Um, macaque screams, piglet screams and squeals. Um, you know, uh, all of these are chock full of noise, particularly, but other nonlinear acoustic um, phenomena as well. So I said, maybe the sound of fear, or more generally arousal, may be nonlinear. And um, there was a big review a number of years ago by this guy, Fitch, 
And um, in a long series of papers and reviews, he talked about the production of nonlinear uh, uh, sounds uh, and then had a throwaway um, paragraph, couple sentences saying, oh, maybe these function to um, prevent habituation because they're somewhat unpredictable. So maybe these nonlinearities can be evocative because they're unpredictable, and this creates an honest signal of fear. So we did a playback experiment. We um, had a, a, a normal adult alarm call. We took out five milliseconds of that call and put in broadband white noise, and then we um, also just took out five milliseconds of that call. Yeah? I'm looking at the spectrograms and looking for the presence of noise and these other attributes that are the product of, that can be produced in a, if a system becomes nonlinear, very abrupt frequency transitions and these other acoustic characteristics. Um, so if you listen to this carefully, um, you'll hear the middle one sounds a little raspier. Okay. Marmots care about that? Yeah, they do. Calls with noise suppress foraging compared to normal calls or si calls with silence added. Now, I will say <laughs> that this is a nonlinear sound in the sense that it's on, it's off, and it's back on again. Um, but um, clearly, the addition of that noise did something that made these animals um, respond more. A caveat. Um, we went out and said, OK, if animals, if this is true, then maybe stressed animals should produce noisier calls. So we scoured our collection of poop and court levels and occasions when we recorded calls. We didn't find that. We found that while scared marmot pups produce noisy screams, scared adult marmots seem to better articulate their calls. Maybe this is the Clint Eastwood make my day hypothesis. You know, if you really want to get a message across, articulate it clearly. So I think alarm signals have multiple functions. And maybe these more articulated calls may help better communicate the desired message. I think more work needs to go into this coupling of stress hormones and production and trying to understand this a little better. So um, I'll leave it at that. Now, this isn't just a story about marmots. Um, if you look at, um, pick your common species round. We picked um, Caribbean gray-tailed grackles and played um, a sound that they you know, were not unfamiliar with and played a pure tone. So these are all completely synthetic artificial sounds. Pure tone, pure tone that abru is abruptly shifts up, pure tone that abruptly shifts, shifts down, and pure tone followed by noise. All of these are nonlinear um, uh, attributes or would be the product of a system that was, um, could be described as nonlinear. So the rapid um, downshifts in noise statistically and especially um, re re reduced relaxed behavior in, or the grackles had reduced relaxed behavior after healing, hearing these things. Completely arbitrary sounds, trying to understand, you know, what's going on with this. So there are not a lot of marmots in, in LA, like none. Um, I don't think the zoo has any. And, um, but there are a lot of people who make a lot of money um, making music and movies and things like that. And I was giving a popular talk and talking about this stuff, and I said, I bet this applies to humans. And this guy, Peter Kay, came up to me and introduced himself. And he goes, well, you know, I'm a film score composer, and I am uh, really interested, in, at the time he was studying for a PhD, in how emotions communicated in music. But it, he thought that music itself was divorced from reality, and you really have to look at music with video, because that's how we're evolved to sort of perceive things. OK. So I said, let's collaborate. He's like, OK. So we found a UCLA undergrad to help us. And we asked the question, if humans respond like non-humans to nonlinear sounds, then composers and audio engineers can capitalize on this to evoke emotions. So we asked, do emotionally evocative soundtracks incorporate noise and other nonlinear analogs? So we said, OK, let's go to some movie databases and say, what are the best war movies? Platoon, Patton, Apocalypse Now are the best, some of the best war movies. Um, I think we looked at 94, 104 movies, something like that. <coughs> adventure films, RoboCop, Speed, and Star Wars are some of the best adventure films. Horror films, Psycho, Poltergeist, and Rosemary's Baby are good horror films. Sad, dramatic scenes. I mean, these are the ones that I cry at all the time. So really, the, the, the secret, of the, or the reason I was doing this was to understand why I cry at movies. You know, Titanic, Sunrise, The Green Mile. And uh, we went to and went to those iconographic scenes, you know, the execution scene in The Green Mile. Um, you know, the, the sad scenes in Titanic or 
you know, the shower scene in Psycho. One of those things said, let's look at 30 seconds of sound in that. So that's a real scream. So I don't know if this is an internet myth or not. A number of people in the industry told me that Janet Leigh had the hot water turned off on her by Alfred Hitchcock. And that first scream's a real scream. And then it's more of these dramatic screams. But then you sort of start looking around, and someone said, sent me something recently saying it's an urban myth and had you know, this urban myth website. So I don't know what you believe on the internet. Other than that, it took us a while to figure out how to score these things. Um, but we could do it consistently. And this is, these are not nonlinearities. This is a highly composed piece of sound that involves music, that involves vocalizations or non-vocalizations from humans, that involves um, foley and, and, and diagenic sound and all of these things that makes up this rich tapestry. But can we find things that if they were produced by an animal that normally produced, you know, that had a linear sound production mechanism that we could call these the result of a nonlinear, you know, system being producing them. So screams or, you know, um, sideband subharmonics, abrupt frequency changes up, abrupt frequency amp uh, amplitude changes, etc. So these are you might call them synthetic nonlinearities. Okay. So then we counted the films that had these things and didn't have these things and did some contingency table analyses, and we found that sad films suppress noisy sound effects. And, and sad in these these iconographic scenes and sad films, you have fewer noisy sound effects than other things. Sad films enhance abrupt musical frequency changes while horror films suppress them. I just make it clear, by noisy, you're talking to a uh, significant fraction of the spectrum which has positive uh, power. Energy at many different frequencies in an unstructured way. Right. So right. in a, in a nonlinear system, it would be deterministic chaos, which is precise. In my synthetic playbacks, we used white noise, which is not deterministic chaos. So white rather than white. I used white. Um, I want to, this summer, playback deterministic chaos, which I need an algorithm to produce, and compare that to white noise. I bet there's no difference in response. But I, I, reviewers keep asking, so I think I'm going to do it. So, um, but, but you know, looking at a spectrogram visually, that's what, that's what we're saying is noise. Um, sad films enhance musical sidebands while horror films suppress them. Horror films use noisy female screams, duh, um, while sad films suppress them. I mean, isn't that what a horror film's about? Um, and, and, um, and, and that's all correlative, and that's great. I mean, that's kind of cool. And I was talking with a friend of mine at UCLA who's in the communication studies, Greg Bryant, and I said, Greg, you study humans and emotions and, and signals, you know, um, can we do some experiments with people? He's like, oh, yeah. Um, and so Greg, who's also a musician, and Peter um, uh, started writing music. And um, the question was, can you know, experimentally added nonlinear phenomena, simulated nonlinear phenomena, manipulate perceptions of arousal and valence? So um, we played a number of sorts of things. We had five seconds of Muzaki Muzak. This is a particular exemplar. And then at five seconds, it either continued or it became noisy or it had a frequency shift up or a frequency shift down. So that's noise added. And you can think about frequency up or frequency down as well. And um, we then asked people, oops, we then asked people what they thought about these things. Now, we embedded this actually in a multimodal experiment where we had benign video clips. And that gets a little more confusing. We can talk about that later on. Um, but the benign video clips were people walking down the street making a right turn, people sitting and reading something and turning the page, people sitting and after five seconds getting the cup of coffee, people answering the phone after five seconds. You can imagine, we imagined, that answering the phone after five seconds when that something got ominous and noisy or something, it's like, who died? You know? Um, so, but benign video clips and sounds. So we had um, 42 undergraduates, mix of males and females. Um, 12 of these different 10 second emotionally neutral compositions, um, whatever simulated nonlinearity we were using um, was added at the five second mark. We had a bunch of fillers with no nonlinearities, but it was within subjects design. And we asked students to rate on a negative five to positive five scale how emotionally stimulating or active 
how rousing was this and what was the valence, how positive or negative were these sounds. Um, and we used repeated measures ANOVA. And what we found was that arousal enhanced, was enhanced by noise and frequency up. So here's the control, and here's, let's just look at arousal. So arousal went up when perceived arousal increased when um, the noise was there. And perceived arousal went up compared to control when the frequency up. Valence, how positive. Things became less positive when noise was added, and things became less positive when there was a frequency down. So I think we've cracked the code. Right now we're wiring people up. Um, I mean, literally, we're wiring people up. It took a while to figure out how to use all these autonomic things, um, but it's, it's running right now. And after we wire people up, we want to get some money and put people in tubes um, and see what part of their brains light up. Um, but what's interesting about this is, unlike much of the musical arousal literature, I would say this comes from a very biological basis and understanding. So I would call that marmot-inspired music. Um, and and the, the, the point is that if we can find these fundamentals, that, that work across many species, why shouldn't they work in humans? And maybe people who make a lot more money than I make are capitalizing on this um, implicitly or explicitly. And I've talked to some award-winning um, musicians and film score composers, and they, they're not doing this overtly. They might be doing it, but they're not doing it overtly. So, um, but these people capitalize on our natural responsiveness to, I think, these nonlinear vocal attributes. And, and to evoke emotion in um, film soundtracks and music as well. So let's wrap up. A lot of messages here. Um, marmot alarm calls communicate degree of risk, not predator type, using a bunch of different mechanisms. Alarm calls can be individually distinctive, and this distinctiveness allows receivers to assess call reliability. Um, I think it's generally important to assess call reliability, and I think there are multiple ways of doing so. And that's kind of interesting because as sort of an evolutionary ecologist, whenever I see variation, I want to understand why. What's the evolutionary ecology of this? What's the natural history of this? Why do we see differences among species? A lot of people, you know, um, wake up uh, inspired to understand why we see so many species on Earth. I'm interested in that, of course, but I'm also interested in why we see animals doing things when they do it and where they do it. Um, these screams contain nonlinearities, probably to communicate fear. And these fearful and emotionally evocative sounds are characterized by these nonlinear acoustic elements. And I think humans can capitalize on these to influence and evoke emotion in film and music. And as I said, um, listen to your inner marmot. Um, and and uh, marmot-inspired music is, uh, we're going we're to take this one far and see how far we can go with it. Um, but thanks for your, your time and attention. And, and have a beer or woodchuck cider on Groundhog Day, um, which is coming up soon on February 2nd. And, um, you know. Remember the marmot. Thank you. Uh, oh, we're supposed to use this. Okay. Uh, so uh, you talked on the production side, as a sound engineer, it's production. Um, uh, but what about on the perception side? So are there differences in different species of marmots of hearing or anything like that across any of the species you've, you've Very, considered. very good question. And one reason I looked at marmots is because a marmot is a marmot is a marmot. They differ socially. They differ in maximum body size. But their heads are kind of similar. Their bodies are kind of similar. You would never mistake a marmot you know, for something else. They're, they're pretty, they have the same suite of types of predators. They're all eaten by things in the air. They're all eaten by things on the ground. And most of them can be dug out and eaten by those things as well. So I don't know. I haven't done auditory recordings. There are audiograms of woodchucks. I haven't done them with other species. I haven't done it with the woodchucks. I was just wondering, for example, in good us, question. Age, age differences make a big difference. Yep. Uh, that, it, 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 it's, it's a good question. I don't hear anything anymore. I was a DJ, and I'm, I'm deaf. When you were recording the screams, was there a difference between a constrained animal versus one that was able to move? I was just thinking if you were running at the same time that you're trying to release a scream, it would be vocalized differently than if you were like contained within a cage. Sometimes they screamed while they were sitting in the cages and we were going down to pick them up. S sometimes they screamed when they were in our hands. So I was actually thinking like if an animal was pinned by a predator, 
would the screen be different? We had some foxes kill most of our animals in town, um, re uh, pups particularly, until they, this one fox learned how to kill adults, which we'd never seen in 50 years of studying marmots. Um, uh, 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 and the, one, the pups that get killed, they don't say anything. The other ones might be alarm calling, but um, the foxes just wait outside their burrows and pounce on them. Um, I, you know, some of the hypotheses about screams are that a scream is so attractive, it brings in everyone else. Um, it brings in the predators. Um, and that well, some of the hypotheses about screaming are if an animal screams, it'll bring in other predators. The predators will get in a fight. The prey will escape. Um, certainly the mothers paid attention to the screams of their kids. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether they even heard. I mean, they're individually distinctive, but how would they know that? I mean, really, I mean, it's not like you hear animals scream. So these are very, very rare vocalizations. I've never heard them. I don't think I've ever heard them naturally given. Um, in 15,000 marmot captures, we had one non-pup scream. And my grad student said, what a wussy. <laughs> it was a yearling male, and he was being held, and he screamed. And they looked at him and said, really? Really? So. In regards to the claim here that uh, the marmots do not uh, communicate predator type, uh, what do you, what's your take on Slobotnikov's prairie dog stuff and the claims that he makes? Um, you know, um, people gave Khan a lot of grief for a long time, but I think he's done the experiments to show that um, prairie dogs have some degree of functionally referential communication. I don't know what to make of the, the different colors. So prairie dogs seem to communicate different things about, say different things when they see coyotes versus um, eagles. Um, he also claimed they could tell individual investigators apart because they would wear different colors when they approached them. This is quite possible. Um, uh, he, I don't yeah, think he claims they, they, they developed their a new novel alarm calls to uh, humans with rifles or things like that. Uh, the, the playback stuff for the functionally referential I think is good stuff. I, I, you know, a lot of the other stuff is production. It's based on discriminant function analysis. It doesn't have the playback experiments showing different results. It's probably there. But in many cases, you find animals um, produce different sounds, but you can't find good evidence that they respond to those different sounds. They may, but if you don't have a good dependent variable, you're not going to see it. So I don't know. But I'm, I'm, I was surprised that marmots don't. Well, that's good to hear because we put a chapter of, of uh, him in our book on cognitive animals. So. <laughs> Oh, uh, yes, I'm curious. Uh, is there any way to extract some information content in the, from the sound itself, whether it's linear, nonlinear? Which of them can carry more information, less information? Is it part of it, or is just that the fact that it becomes nonlinear is just a kind of physical effect that they cannot control their vocal? I, I think that's a full employment scheme, and I oh. think those questions are. Are, are generally important. Um, if noise, if, I mean, yeah. if things are predictable, we've been talking the past two days about the transitions themselves are quite important too. But looking for potential, so the question is, is there potential information in, the, in having some noise in a vocalization? Yes, because animals respond differently to vocalizations with and without noise. They're produced in slightly different situations. So we have the continuity from production to perception or you know, response, responsiveness. Um, how does this act in general? Is more information encoded in this? Don't know. Good question. And that's, frankly, trying to understand um, computational approaches to begin asking these questions is one thing that we've been brainstorming and plotting and planning about. Um, hi, I have a less science-y question. I heard um, that Last year, remember the year before, that a lot of the marmots died? How has that been affecting your research, or have you shifted maybe more to birds with these? Yeah, so um, our population, um, <laughs> our population uh, goes up and down. And uh, over the past, forget the past two years, but before, the decade before that, um, basically during my tenure there, the population tripled in size. And it was bigger than it ever was. Um, while Ken was there, you had between you know, 20 and 60 animals, maybe. Um, we went up to 300 and something. Um, and then it crashed. 
Um, and you know, we have a, a nice story about the rise and can attribute it to you know, warming, et cetera. And we had a really long winter two years ago. Um, and if you look in the past, those long winters are associated with animals dying off. Um, and then following that, animals that survived the winter didn't really breed. So we had all these experiments planned. Basically, the die-off has been killing all my behavioral experiments. The population biology is marching along. But it's really boring to go out and sit in a meadow and not hear anything or see anything. And animals don't call a lot. So we're having very few recordings. Um, because probabilistically, we're not encountering enough individuals. So it's sort of a pain in the butt for the behavioral stuff. Um, but it's really interesting because it gives us an opportunity. My social behavior work these days is asking questions about how demographic opportunity provide or demographics provide an opportunity for more complex social behavior. So we have all sorts of social observation and social network parameters and descriptors during a ramp up and now we've got small groups and it's going to ramp up again you know, over time. So in the long run, um, population crashes are good. Um, in the short run, they're not so good. So then um, this past um, winter was really short. So it's like the longest winter and the shortest winter ever. So a lot of females bred. And they were, the, the kids were doing well because the foxes died off and the coyotes died off. So you know, the population looked like it was good. And then um, my family skis uh, in Colorado every year the week before Christmas. So here's an embarrassing story. So uh, you know, a friend sends me a photograph of our cabin at, at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And there's no snow in like the second week of December. There's nothing on the ground. And you know, we're looking at the weather forecast. And we always go the week before Christmas. We're looking at the weather forecast, and there's no snow. There's no snow. And this is really bad because it's cold. And snow is a blanket. And I'm like, you know, the marmots are going to die. Save a marmot. Send a blanket to Colorado. So I wrote a Huffington Post blog about that. And they, <laughs> held, it, they held it for a couple of days. And uh, by the time they posted it, it started snowing. But we canceled our ski trip. Um, went to Tahoe, where there was a lot of snow. Um, but uh, I don't know. It will be interesting to see if they all die this winter, because there was a long period of time with, without a blanket. Are they still going to hibernate? Yes. Marmots, are, uh, marmots in general are the biggest of the true hibernators. If you're too big, you can't lose enough mass to get your body low enough to really save. So marmots in their thermal neutral zone, um, which is a, a, a zone between and these guys, I think it's a, between 2 and 4 or 5 degrees Celsius. They burn about a gram of fat per day in deep torpor. Um, if you go below that, they burn more to get back into that zone. If they go above that, their metabolic rate's higher just because their body heat's higher and they're burning more. So hibernation is an amazing way to get through the winter unless you run out of fuel. Got a couple unrelated questions. Uh, the one is, so ap after all this work you've done on their vocal uh, signals, especially alarm and screams, what do you think about Morton's motivation structural rules and the predictions, like how well would they apply to your system? Well, I mean, I think what we're doing with these nonlinearities is really looking, the reason we're doing frequency ups and frequencies downs, and I'm struggling with this, um, is to, um, to sort of look at the evocativeness and the unique evocativeness of things. So even though a frequency up and a frequency down has the same pattern in the sense the same frequency range is manipulated, a frequency down is associated with uh, whereas a frequency up is a uh, and um, you would expect a hua uh, would be, you know, would be more evocative than a hua. So I'm asking those questions in a variety of different species, not necessarily with marmots. So I think that motivation structure <coughs> rules, um, we'll see how far they go. But I think it's, it's good. It's easier to work with fear-inducing things because your dependent variables maybe make more sense than other sorts of things. But you know, so I don't think I can map that whole space and understand that whole space. But overblowing systems, fear, I'll, I'll, I'll play with that some more. So we did something with white-crowned sparrows, which have a, so we did the same experiment we did with the, the grackles with white-crowned sparrows. White-crowned sparrows have a whistle to start with. So a whistle is kind of <laughs> like a pure tone. So actually, they paid attention to, the, to, the, to our stimuli a little more than we wanted them to. I hadn't thought about that beforehand. So I've got to look at some other things that don't have whistles. But um, we'll see how general it is by hacking more species. And the other one I still haven't formulated well, because uh, I just don't know the, 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 the vocal system well. Uh, is it tuba throat singers? So do you know much about, like, because that's an inherently nonlinear vocal system, right? Uh, 
I was just curious if there were like anthropological explanations for this, this particular. So system. one thing that Greg does is he works with people all over the world, and what we want to do is we want to pack up on a computer and give to our colleagues at UCLA and other places, you know, our 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 movie thing and go to other cultures, um, and and sort of see and make more music and see how people respond to these things and what they think about them. But we want to better. We want to make sure that the perceptions are grounded with the physiology. So we're waiting for the physiological results to trickle in before we have a traveling road show. Because there is a, I mean, you know, undergraduates at UCLA are not representative of, well, actually they are representative of the world, but uh, not really. Thank you very much. <laughs>